There are things happening in Israel today that have Bible students on the edge of their chairs. And here to talk about some of those exciting events is uh, author, lecturer, Tom Horn. Tom, welcome back. Hey, Gary, always great to be with you. It's good to have Tom here. Uh, of course, Tom and uh, uh, the Skywatch cr uh, tour over there are always really, really busy. And when I talk with Tom, I'm always amazed how many f irons he has in the fire. Uh, but uh, it's good to have you here. Yeah, well, wonderful. Thanks for having me. Now, on our last program with Tom, we talked about uh, this book, The Rabbis, Donald Trump, and there's a small, almost barely readable segment of the, of the title, and the top secret plan to build the Third Temple. And uh, I hope that uh, kind of piques your interest, because there is a top secret plan, right? Yeah, there has been. Of course, part of this has been going on in Israel for a while, you know, the Temple yeah. Institute, the Temple Mount Faithful. Right. Uh, we're aware that even uh, Netanyahu has secretly been funding some of the effort that is uh, expensing some of the different things that they've built to be used in the Third Temple. Notice that the Sanhedrin uh, at the close of the year invited 70 nations. You know, on the last program we were talking about the significance of the number 70 and how that's connected to Donald Trump. It's connected to this election year, 5777. Mm -hmm. It's connected to the original Cyrus. We went over all of that in the first program. We failed to mention that in addition to that, the Sanhedrin invited 70 nations to do what? To come over and to bless the altar that's already been built that's going to be used in the uh, new forthcoming third temple. So a great deal of effort has been uh, going forward for a while. Now why did I use this subtitle, The Top Secret Plan to yeah. Build the Third Temple? Right. Well, as people will learn in the book and as we discussed on the last program, I was made aware by a member of the President's Faith Council that two prominent rabbis from Israel had sat down in Washington D.C. last year with Donald Trump, Jared Kirshner, and a couple of members of the Faith Council uh, and let Donald Trump know that in their opinion the only reason that he won, uh, in fact the rabbi that oversees King David's tomb in Israel has said this publicly since, that the only reason that he won is he was driven by the power of Meshach or the power of the Messiah to help them build the third temple. Uh, and then he was told in Washington the only way you're going to win again in 2020 and the only way you're going to succeed as a president is if you get behind the effort when the time is right to help us build the third temple, to speak in favor of it, to put use your political influence around the world to help us with what we need to get this job done. Well, going back to uh, the evening uh, of uh, his election, I think we all noticed that there was something very unusual about that election. I mean, mm -hmm. he was not expected to win. It was like one second it was here, one second it, w it was over here, and and the the media were flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Some of them cried openly on the air right. on the night of his election. They've been crying since. <laughs> <laughs> but the the point I'm trying to make is that, that it was an unusual uh, election. There it was it was tinged with uh, uh, a, a bit of a, a, a prophetic undertone, like something really monumental has happened. And then in your book you just carry that, that story on to the present day and then mm -hmm. forward to what could possibly happen. Right, that's exactly right. So th there is a great deal and people will learn in the book of all the efforts around the world right now that's intentionally inching the world towards the construction of the Third Temple. Now I should say something Gary, I talked to an Orthodox rabbi recently on the phone, he's a really well known rabbi, works with uh, Breaking Israel News, uh, and uh, I explained it to him that when we talk about the connection between the Antichrist and the construction of the Third Temple, I can tell you where I'm coming from. I am not uh, implying evil intentions on the part of the Sanhedrin. I'm not saying that they know that this is going to result in the Antichrist and that's what they're working toward. Uh, my uh, traditional you know, upbringing, college studies, all that was that they will simply be deceived. 
They will believe that this is a man who's everything that he says he's going to be. People need to understand that uh, the Jews don't think of the Messiah the same way we do. You know, we, Jesus is our model of what right. the Messiah is. My kingdom is not of this earth and all that. The Jewish Messiah's kingdom is very much of this earth. They see him as a political figure, maybe a guy that will fight great wars. It comes from the Old Testament idea of the anointed one, a king who is anointed by the priesthood to represent the, the, the nation state. So, yeah, and, you, and you know, uh, as you talk, uh, of course we all think of uh, Ezekiel's war, you know, Ezekiel mm-hmm. 38, Gog of the land of Magog. I think we've all read that a thousand times. Uh, as you approach the end of the Old Testament, you, you have Zechariah and then finally Malachi who talks about the coming of Moses and Elijah. You know, right. we're all thinking about these things. And, but if this famous verse in uh, Zechariah 12, uh, the burden of the word of the Lord, uh, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about uh, when they shall be in siege. Uh, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. In other words, uh, this prophecy talks about a refocusing of global energy on the city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing that right now. Well I do too. In fact you might have noticed uh, that uh, Pope Francis, and by the way we can talk about this because I think the Vatican and the Washington DC also have a different kind of a role they're going to play in the coming of the third temple. But uh, Pope Francis recently met with the Moroccan king, uh, Mohammed VI, mm-hmm. and they signed a proclamation around Jerusalem, right? Saying yep. that Jerusalem is a city not just for Jews, but it is a city that is open to all Abrahamic faiths, including right. the Muslims uh, as well as the uh, Christians. Of course, I did notice. Uh, when they sign that proclamation they only refer to Jerusalem by its Muslim name uh, and by its English name. They refer- refuse to refer to it as Yerusalem, the Hebrew name of that holy city. Indeed. And they have uh, pseudonyms for, this, for the city and the Temple Mount. Right. Uh, which, uh, neither of which have much to do with the Bible. But right. That's another story. Tom Horn is uh, and has been for years, and I don't know how far back it goes, but but you have a talent, I think a God-given talent for digging in and getting the story behind the story, uh, particularly when it comes to Bible prophecy. And, and you are to be uh, congratulated and praised for, for doing that. I want to turn to one, another of your books. This, this one is called The Saboteurs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, uh, it, it talks about war, it talks about um, plots and plans mm-hmm. and things going on. The deep state. The deep state. Let's talk about that for a minute. Why did you write Saboteurs? And, well, and what's the nugget? Yeah. The story well, behind the story. Here. So once again, and by the way I'm not the Bible scholar that you are, I just try to memorize stuff that guys like you say so that I can sound like I know what I'm talking about. He really is. <laughs> no, I, well, if I'm anything I'm probably really more of uh, an investigator. Um, you know, and that's what I like to do. I like to get on the trail of something that hasn't been talked about a thousand times before by other people. So when I got a call from the Faith Council saying, I've got, you know, a bombshell for you, the rabbis are in Donald Trump's ear, that's what compelled me then to follow up in an investigation to write the book, The Rabbis, Donald Trump, and the Top Secret Plan to Build the Third Temple. That's the same thing with saboteurs. What happened with the saboteurs was the WikiLeaks, right? And of course Assange has now been arrested and we'll see where that's going to go. But in the WikiLeaks, uh, without getting too far off topic here, there were revelations between the people that were working in and around Hillary Clinton, including John Podesta, her campaign manager, that illustrated um, emails that they're sending back and forth between each other, that illustrated that they were practicing telemic um, occultism, right out of the Liber of Aliester Crowley. And I, some stuff jumped off the page. I, I don't want to get off track here, but it involved what I think they believed about Hillary Clinton, mm-hmm. her birth, going all the way back to the 1950s and this sex magic rituals that were being, you know, conducted, the Babylon working. Uh, Jack Parsons, the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Yeah, and let me just speak to that for a minute. Uh, Alistair Crowley and Jack Parsons were both uh, uh, absolutely 
preoccupied in, in, in every aspect of their life with, with uh, black magic, uh, the, the ancient magic, the, going all the way back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tried to incorporate that into the lives of important people right. who, then living. Jack Parsons, the head of JPL, Jet Propulsion Labor Laboratories, and you always say to yourself, well, wait a minute, did you say Jet Propulsion Laboratory? Right. The people who helped us go to the moon, right. Jack Parsons was uh, virtually a high priest. He was. Now, what's happening there? And this, of course, is where Tom comes in. What's happening? Well, and, and so the people, so we've whetted their appetite a little bit, but uh, the deal that you're offering for a donation to your ministry is going to include them receiving the book Saboteur. So they'll be able to read all of that. And, yeah. But to, I was answering your question, you know, what compels me to continue writing when I've been trying to retire for the past 25 years? <laughs> it's because something will grab my attention and yeah. it will feel like it must be investigated to get to the, the bottom line, right? And that's what always puts me, and by the way, right now I'm on my next top secret project, You'll know about it, I guess, late this year. Okay, I'm yeah. waiting, I'm waiting. Well, let's, let's go back. Uh, you've got some chapters in here. One is uh, the deep occultism of the deep state. But I want to ask uh, about chapter 5, uh, and you say, have we entered the fourth turning? What's the fourth turning? The fourth turning is a theory of um, how um, empires rise and collapse uh, there were people around Donald Trump during his election that ascribed to this idea of the fourth turning that we are now entering into the fourth turning. The fourth turning in a nutshell is, you know, dreamers uh, are at the beginning of every great culture. Right. They are the artists. They are the artisans. They are the people that imagine what a great culture could become. Then the generation follows them, the second turning. They're the ones that actually put their shoulder to the plow and start building the industrial revolution, right? They're the mm -hmm. ones that, that yeah. build the great culture. The third turning are those that kind of just live off the fat of the calf. Everything that was built before them, they enjoy it. Maybe think of it a lot the way we are in America right now today, living off what the great generation mm -hmm. built, the, the strength of capitalism versus now we're all talking about socialism and everybody wants everything free. Sure. By the way, which I also think is tied to the third temple and the coming of Antichrist, socialism. Uh, but then the fourth turning is when society collapses. This is the fall of Rome. And there were those around Donald Trump who believed that we were entering into the fourth turning. Now, when you mentioned, uh, and by the way, that was just a little nugget that slipped by, but it didn't escape my attention. Uh -huh. You talked about the fourth turning, the Antichrist, and socialism, yeah. all in the same right. uh, lump. We are hearing a lot about socialism today as a new ideal, and uh, uh, we never th thought we would hear about that seriously again, but here it comes. And, yeah. And the idea is that uh, there's got to be a way to provide for everyone so that everyone gets the same thing, which is one of the great myths of history. Yeah. But it, on the other hand, you associate the coming of the Antichrist right. with that. Well, Venezuela today is a great lesson. And uh, some of the people over there that did well in business are screaming to high heaven to Americans, please don't go down right. this Bernie Sanders or Casio-Cortez Oh, crazy old Cortez. Don't, don't go down this road. I didn't say and that. And by the way, in, you didn't. I did. I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. Uh, it, it, history has proven this over and over yeah. again. There's never been a socialist or a Marxist culture uh, that sustained very long without yeah. utterly in, ending in collapse. Uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher so famously said socialism is a great I is the greatest idea, right? Until you run out of somebody else's money to That's give away. That's very right? true. Uh, so, but without getting into that whole commentary, the reason that I connect it though to, to the rise of Antichrist is when you look at the system of Antichrist, everybody is basically a ward of the state. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. And also no buying, no selling, and except you accept this mark. So it seems to be a system, a monetary system of controlling investments and, and everything, you're a ward of the state. That's what socialism does. The big lie says, if you'll just come over, let Bernie Sanders tax us at 90%, yeah. right? You'll have everything free. Free education, everything's free. Well, over time though, the, 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 the piggy bank runs empty and the whole thing collapses. But for a season, I think that's going to be the lie of Antichrist. He's going to be the ultimate big brother that's going to take care of all of your needs and everybody's going to love him, 
right? A global system based on socialism. Yeah, you and I remember all this, the mark of the beast. Uh, I, I remember when a little plastic credit card came out. You know, you go into a gas station, you buy your gas. They put it in a machine and it goes click, click. And uh, it prints your card number on paper. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you put it back in your wallet. Uh, and let's fast forward a decade or two, and suddenly you've got a magnetic strip on your mm -hmm. card. And then uh, another decade, and wow, you've got a microchip in your card. Right. And another decade or two, you don't need a microchip. That's right. <laughs> right. right. Everything is suddenly in the cloud. That's right. And yeah. the Antichrist system has been talked about for such a long time. Right. Well, now DARPA is funding to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars their latest project, which will involve an extra cranial, no bigger than a Bluetooth, an extra cranial device you'll put above your ear. It will read the neuron pulses of your brain, and it will allow you to connect to the cloud just using your mind. Right? And of course, they think this is the greatest thing since apple pie, vast amounts of knowledge. But our old friend Dr. Chuck Misler one time talked yeah. about this and he warned. He said, but don't forget that's a two-way road. That's opening a gateway into your mind for external sources to be able to access, a kind of digital possession. The old idea of the ghost in the machine, right? Oh, yeah. Now there's another chapter in here, chapter four, and you're going to, again, you're including this book yes. with people that send you a donation. But chapter 4 asks, has Zenith 2016 just been fulfilled? And I, it's amazing that you brought that up because I was going to ask you about that <laughs> next. Zenith 2016. That takes me back a while yeah. and from then to now. Let's talk about that. Yeah, you and I did programs on that. Uh, yeah. Look, in a nutshell, because I know we'll run out of time if I go into too much detail. Years ago, again, something provoked me. I, I discovered that there were different ancient cultures that saw the years between 2012 to 2016 as the time, depending on your worldview, when the Messiah would appear. Even the Mayans, when two great witnesses would appear on earth, sound like right out of the book of Revelation. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, or in the year 2016, you had famous turn of the century preachers like Jonathan Edwards. We duplicate that in the book. His letter he writes to Yale University arguing why he believes that the Antichrist will manifest on earth in the year 2016, the very year that Donald Trump, and by the way I don't believe Donald Trump's the Antichrist for those that might make that sudden leap in judgment, Okay, but uh, when he believes that the spirit of Antichrist will rise on the earth. So I, when I wrote that book it was really asking the question, and I include the whole chapter on that in this book. So they don't need the book uh, Zena 2016, but I asked the question, why that all these ancient societies believed that was going to happen in 2016. It's the whole nexus of the book, right? right. But get this, these, these uh, uh, Orthodox Jews in Israel today, most of them are Kabbalists that are talking about the coming of the Third Temple. They're mystical Jews. Um, and these are the very people who study not only Kabbalah, but they study the, the Zohar. Now the Zohar, mystical commentary, written over 700 years ago in primeval Aramaic, right? Sure. But there is a section and by Orthodox Jews. There's a section in there called the Veera section that has a subsection called Signs Heralding Mashiach, or the Coming of the Messiah. And it is in that section of the Zohar from 700 years ago that they predict that the Messiah, Messiah ben David, will appear on the earth following the year 2012, between 2012 and 13 to 2016. Now sure enough, the same people that today are saying that God raised up Donald Trump uh, to be a Cyrus-like figure who is ultimately going to help them build the third temple, they're the very ones following 2012, 13, 57, 76 is the way their calendar would work, that said uh, the Messiah is here, uh, don't leave Israel if you're, you know, if you're attending the, 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 the schools over there, the Hebrew schools, you're studying Hebrew, don't leave Israel. If you're living abroad you need to return to Israel because the Messiah is getting ready to make Himself known. Uh, and uh, so they were following the Zohar. That's what they're studying, that's what they're looking for, and they connect that to the arrival of Donald Trump and the impetus now around the world really. Uh, to build the third temple. There are Christian organizations today that are meeting with uh, Hebrew scholars in Israel that also are pushing for the building of the third temple. And of course guys like me, I look at it and say I understand you don't really know what you're doing. Uh, Gary, 
in, in 2012, there were a lot of Christians who also voted for Obama. In that second term, things started becoming more anti-Semitic, yes. and some of them withdrew, and they're the very ones that also voted for Donald Trump. Now, why did I bring that up? Because I see that as kind of similar to what the Jews are going to do. They're going to vote in favor of a guy that they believe to be something that later on is going to illustrate he's not at all what he sold himself to be, and they will be deceived when he defiles the third temple, they'll turn away from him. So I don't blame the Jews for what's going to happen. Right. I say that it's a kind of deception. Yeah, and just to uh, augment a bit what uh, Tom is saying, uh, Christians are urged to uh, stay clear of the mystical and the magical, and, mm -hmm. and we do. Mm -hmm. But other people uh, do not stay clear of those things. And we talked about Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley and others, and on the Jewish side, there is a Jewish mysticism. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it r is really, really uh, enlightening to watch what these other people are doing and thinking. You, I think you're probably at the, uh, uh, at the lead edge of the pack for watching those developments. And you started back in 2012, and I remember very well uh, uh, what you wrote about 2012 and, and years uh, to come. Right. And sure enough, you know, we had an election in 2016. Right that uh, may prove that uh, old Jonathan Edwards was right, because <laughs> if indeed the Third yeah. Temple is built, it is going to lead to the arrival of Antichrist, who would have to be on earth now, and old enough that perhaps he's presenting himself as this messianic figure. Now, by the way, uh, there's, a, there's an award-winning rabbi that just a couple weeks ago, Levi Sudri, uh, he recognized Netanyahu and said, Netanyahu is the reincarnation of Jonathan, the, the son of King Saul, but more importantly he says he is, uh, um, what is what do they call it? Messiah uh, ben Yosef. Messiah ben Yosef who's the first Messiah. He's the practical guy, right? He's the yeah. guy that comes and does the political stuff and does the prep work. sets everything. He's the John the Baptist like yeah, figure. Right. And that he is paving the way <clears throat> for arrival of Messiah ben David who then is going to restore the Davidic kingdom. Uh, but again who many dispensationalist Christians, who you know, much of the people from my camp and a lot of your viewers uh, look at that and they say, oh my goodness, this guy is literally forecasting the arrival of who we would call Antichrist uh -huh. imminently, and do they know somebody? Are they talking? Why are they saying he's already here? And we know this, and he's getting ready to present himself. Unless they're just making it up, and I don't think that's happening, they're, they're literally dialoguing about a particular character. Tom has written, well, I, I can't name all the books that Tom has written. I've got four books on the table here, but that's just a small sampling. And I want to go back to the rabbis, Donald Trump, and this fine print here says, and the top secret plan to build the third temple. Uh, he's got a talent for looking in places uh, where other people just go right on by. <laughs> and I love it. Uh, his books are always revelatory in special ways. And uh, uh, this book, The Rabbis, Donald Trump, and Third Temple, yours for a gift of $25, free shipping anywhere in the United States. Just go to prophecywatchers.tv and click on the online bookstore. Scroll down, you'll find Tom Horn's uh, name there, and uh, you're going to find uh, the last trumpet package, including this book uh, concerning Donald Trump and three others. Uh, we uh, love to put things together in packages, and we're calling this the last trumpet package. Uh, the Donald Trump book, plus uh, the book by Tom, Tom Horn that we just talked about. It's called Saboteurs, and it's got that wonderful chapter in there that has that, that nugget that you talked about just a minute ago. Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters and the Milieu. What is a milieu? Well, it's a, a societal sweeping development. And uh, where are we ever in the middle of one right now? These three books uh, uh, and uh, the book on Donald Trump, we're calling The Last Trumpet Package. All of these yours for a gift of $75, free shipping anywhere in the United States. If you haven't experienced Tom Horn in print, wow, you've got a great surprise coming. Prophecywatchers.tv and click on the online bookstore. Now, this leaves me three or four minutes to talk to Tom Horn again. And you've got me all excited here about some of the things that are happening. The interesting thing about Bible prophecy is that we try hard to be uh, documentarian 
and we get all excited, and we tend to overrun our headlights, and we say, wait a minute, let's go back. Sure. We all do that, right? But something really is happening, uh, and, I, and I'd like to conclude with that thought today. I, as you look around, uh, I know your heart beats a little faster, because you actually see things ha- locking into place uh, that the Bible has talked about in ways that we've all been excited about for the last 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah, well again, if you, if you can temporarily put yourself in the mind of one of these rabbis that happens to believe in gematria, biblical numerology, mm-hmm. and we do know that numbers are very important in the Bible, and God often uh, instructed them to build things a certain length. Even the book of Revelation and prophecies yeah. go out and measure these lines. So uh, if you put yourself in their mind and you see the 70th anniversary of Israel, uh, Donald Trump, the 45th president, Isaiah 45 is where it talks about the coming of Cyrus. There, there's so much, and in the book we just go into illustration after illustration, and all the commentary that's coming from the different rabbis about uh, Donald Trump. Um, then you'll see why I felt compelled to write this book. Now, by the way, there's a whole other part that we didn't have time to talk about, we won't have time to talk about. Uh, and this goes into some of the conversations you and I have had in the past, the layout of the Vatican. So here the, the, the Pope Francis, he meets recently with the Muslim Moroccan king, Mohammed VI. They sign a proclamation involving Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem's becoming that, that, that cup of trembling, Gary, that you were talking about yes. earlier. And they want to assert in the public mind that the Muslims and the Christians also have a right to Jerusalem as much as Jer- Jerusalem is a universal city, it's important to everybody is basically what they're saying. But, the, but, but there's no doubt that the Vatican, Chris Putnam and I when he was around, you know, we wrote extensively about the Vatican's interest in controlling Jerusalem uh, in the future. And now those are historical facts, right? Well, and, and it goes all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and, and that, that mountain where God told Abraham to go and to slay his son as a sacrifice. And you and I know where that mountain is. Right. Downtown Jerusalem. Right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Mount Zion, from which Jesus Christ will rule over the earth for a thousand year millennial reign, right? Right. Is that little tiny contested piece of property that everybody fears is going to lead to World War Four or Three, right? Uh, if, if an effort is made to build a third temple. The book goes into different ways a third temple could be built, how you could get around all of these different objectives. It also ties Washington, D.C., the layout of Washington, D.C., as well as the layout of the Vatican City, all to the arrival of Antichrist, right? The prophecies are actually there. Uh, inside the Sistine Chapel, the Kume Sibyl prophesying the second coming of Apollo. You and I have done shows uh, on before. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Down to our last fi- <laughs> 15 seconds, and, and he begins again. That's the way it is with Tom Horn. Hey, the package is called The Last Trumpet Package. These four books, highlighted by the rabbis Donald Trump and the Third Temple, you will be excited, I guarantee you. Tom, thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Gary. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, you keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. In the meantime, keep watching, everybody. 